Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Miss Connie. Just a couple of things before we get rolling today. Um, Michelle, if you could pray for her family, my goodness, uh, between all the tragedy that's going on in and around our family and everything she's experienced so far, uh, boy, she's pretty low these days. So please pray for her. Um, pray for peace in her heart, if you could. And then uh, just two more things, given the fact that today we have kind of an academic theme. If you look in your bulletin, you'll see that there are uh, there's a new section. One section says homework, and that is just something to look at during the course of the week, ponder, maybe uh, apply it to what you're doing uh, during the course of the week. It, it applies to what we're going to be speaking about today. And just so you know, homework will make up about 30% of your grade, which counts for 100% of nothing. But I hope that it serves you in some way. And lastly, you'll see uh, Western Virginia Regional Jail was added to the prayer list. I pray, uh, I ask that you pray for those folks over there. Uh, I'm telling you right now, it is uh, meeting the people, the individuals. They're as easy to love as any of us, and they're just in really tough situations. So uh, if you could... Uh, join with me in prayer for them, add them to your prayer list uh, for uh, hope and restoration in their life. And if you would, can we pray together this morning? Lord God, I thank you for joining us together here this morning. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. Lord God, I thank you for each person that you brought into this building this morning, Lord God, and each soul that you're ushering into eternity. Lord God, I thank you for each spirit that you're drawing close to yourself and the spirit that you've placed in each one of us as a sign of the covenant of peace that you've extended toward us through the grace in our Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, please be with me this morning as we get into your word. Use me as a conduit for the understanding of what you want us to glean from it. Lord God, remove me from this time that we may see a clearer image of your face. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, if the children would like to go downstairs with Miss Irma today, the rest of us, we're going to be looking at 1 John. Yes, ma'am. Oh, my goodness. All right. Can you do me a favor? Mr. Bud, can we sing happy birthday when we wrap up for Miss Lily's dad? This is really, really special. His name is Tony. Yes. This is super important. So, uh, Miss Irma, can we come upstairs in the end? I'll come get you guys. Thank you, Mr. Putt. I'm sorry? I know you do. So here's God's word. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into this world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ had come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus does not come from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 
as we look at John's text, once again, the, the challenge is uh, John was writing to mostly a Jewish audience. And as we view this even more removed with Western eyes, there are certain things that we have to wrap our head around. It, we live in such a fantastic society that is built with human hands. That as we, as we look at things, as we address things, we, we immediately default to the, the physical because of everything that we built. And, and this is just how we resonate. So like, for instance, perhaps you're, this doesn't happen with you, but if, if you're trying to, to wrap your head around getting ready this morning and if you think you're coming to church, you may be thinking of this physical building. And then maybe you're saying, no, Brian, no, 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 no. I understand the church. We are a body of believers. The church is a group of people. Well, even that is, is slightly removed from reality. In, in fact, the church is a spiritual group. We are a group of souls that are coming together to worship under the obedience of God to the grace and love of Christ Jesus. There's so much of the text within Scripture that we, we need to understand is, is not tangible. It's not something we can touch. It's spiritual. This is our kingdom. Now, as we're looking into the text, we have to understand we need to give ourselves a good amount of grace when we trip over things like this, because even if we look, remember in John chapter 3, as Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, I mean, my goodness, he's the, the, the teacher of the teachers. And we see the staid frustration in Jesus as he's saying, you're the teacher and, and you don't know these things. But it's through the revelation of Christ Jesus, our Lord, and, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that it allows us to have more insight through his teaching and through his spirit to get a better understanding of what the spiritual nature of our being actually is. You see, because as man was made in God's image, there are three components to man. We have the physical, which is the flesh. We have the soul, which is the spirit. And we have the spirit, which is the spirit. Every person has those three components. So you may come across people and, and they may say to you, well, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. I guess a good answer to that would be, you don't say. You see, we all are spiritual beings. We have a temporary body of flesh that we dwell in, but, but by and large, what God has made us was to be a soul that was to be driven by the Spirit. The Spirit is what directs the soul. And this is the understanding that we see through, through first century teaching, and this is what, what John is laying out here, and it's a lot easier as we go into Pauline text, so we're going to take a look at that this morning. But the idea is even that the Spirit is not necessarily a rudder, but it's the cognitive understanding that drives the soul. It's the thought process. What the brain is to the body, what makes decisions for the body, is what the spirit is to the soul. Does that make sense? So we have to understand that as, as John is addressing these false teachers that are, have come into the church and then have gone out and they're trying to spread the, these fallacies that Jesus didn't actually come in the flesh. Well, this is an important fallacy. This is something that needs to be confronted because if Jesus didn't come in the flesh, there was no sacrifice. If there was no sacrifice, we're still in our sins. So although we may not agree on everything, there are certain things that we have to have as an understanding, as a group of, of souls that come together, that are saved by grace through faith, that we are indeed saved. And there are some spirits that will embrace that, and there are some spirits that will not embrace that. As Paul writes in Ephesians 2, he says, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. This is your soul. Obviously, we can go out into the world, we can see physical life. But the soul itself is dead. 
It is infirm. In which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children's children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is the natural state of man. This is, this is man outside of Christ Jesus. This is where we all said. Our spirit that is driving our soul is leading us astray. It is tainted by the sin that is in this world. It is corrupt. Now, my two favorite words in all of Scripture, everywhere it appears, it puts a smile on my face. But God. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. As we, as we come together on Sunday, we look at each other, and we may think, wow, here is my saved brother. Here is my saved sister. Praise God for that. What is actually going on, we can't see. There is a saved soul within them that is eternal, that has a changed spirit, a changed heart, a changed understanding. The catalyst, the motivation is just completely different. So when we say somebody is a new creation in Christ, it's, it's not that we see something physically different from them. It's that their person, their heart, their motivation, their spirit has changed from the rest of the world. So when we understand what John's talking about here, that there's, there's a spiritual battle that's going on. Those that are in Christ and those that are out of Christ, they have different motivations. They have a different thought process to their soul. This is, this is the battle that's waging. It's not guns and bombs and that kind of thing that man likes to take place with. This is spiritual. As Paul says in Ephesians 6, 6.12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over the present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. The war that, that rages is a war of the Spirit. Now, we have to understand uh, the, the players in this war, what, what wages war against our soul. Our, the soul of all mankind has three enemies. The three enemies are the flesh, the devil, and the world. And to understand the modus operandi of how this lays out is that the enemy uses the world to tempt the flesh. If we look at the temptation of Jesus, the purpose of it is to give us a different understanding of who God is based on either need or pride. It's very simple. And it's responsive in the, in the natural flesh of man. Without a changed spirit, we'll, we'll, we'll fall prey to that. This is what was going on. You see, as people were coming to church, and, and the gospel is so offensive to man, to understand that I am not good enough to stand before a holy and righteous God, but God, but God, but God, so cherished my soul that he gave his only son for him. to a person that is triggered by pride, to a person that is lured by the spirit of the world, that becomes an offense. Maybe you can fake it for a little bit. Maybe you could say, okay, I, I want to be around uh, these good people, these people that are doing benevolent things. Maybe, maybe it, intellectually it stimulates you. But without a changed spirit, with still maintaining the spirit of the world, 
you will not see the glory of the text. You won't see God. You won't understand him. You won't understand his word. So what do you do? You make up different from it. This is what was happening. Back then it was called Gnosticism. They have different names for it today. So John addresses his congregation. Chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Beloved, my, my, my dear members of my congregation, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Here is the understanding. This is what we need to grasp. There is no Switzerland in the spiritual world. You are either from God or not. Period. Those that are in Christ need to get a clear understanding of what is from God. Why? Because as the enemy is trying to use the world to lure the flesh, he's looking to create and has successfully done so by and large the spiritual inertia that is longing and, and reaching out for the world. How did this happen? John says, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. No, God told me. It doesn't mean that. It means this. The, a, a great example of this, and we don't have this slide because it's just too darn long, but in Acts 17... We see, we see Paul and Silas in Thessalonica. And it says they, they passed through uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia, and they came to Thessalonica, and there was a synagogue filled with Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom. And on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary to Christ for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus who I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of devout Jews and not few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some of the wicked men, uh, uh, I'm sorry, of the rabble, they formed a mob. They set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeing to bring them out of the crowd. Is this of God? Of course not. This is the flesh. They were Jewish leaders. They were comfortable with their position. They clung to the world. It was their world. They didn't understand the spiritual nature of what was going on, that they were being lured by the pride of the flesh to, to create a mob, to create that spiritual inertia, to rise up and to go up against Paul and, and, and Silas. And we see the exact opposite of it. And this is important as we move on through Acts chapter 17. We see the exact opposite of it, and we understand why. As we pick up in verse 10, it says, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Where are you going to go for consultation with anything spiritual? The Word of God. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. They were more noble. There was something different about their spirit. They were longing for God. There was a thirst there that needed to be quenched. And when they heard the good news, it is such good news. They embraced it after they checked it. That's what John's saying here. Test, test, test the spirits. By this you know the Spirit of God. Everyone that confesses Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is from God. How did they confess it? And this is the important part because we think so easy that we could just ask for Jesus to come into our heart and it's all set. Our spirit is renewed. We, we have the Holy Spirit fallen upon us. No, they, they confessed it with their life. They professed Christ with their life because to profess Christ, 
Jesus as the Christ, to profess that it's by his atoning death that I am made clean, that I am made right before God. My life is over. If I'm a Jew, I'm kicked out of the synagogue. If I'm a Gentile, I'm a laughingstock and, and, and just one of those religious fools. It meant something. When, when Paul says that if you profess with your mouth, it's, it's not a cheap profession. It costs them their life, and, and that's the idea. You see, you can't do this without a changed spirit because that's what drives the soul, and that's what motivates the flesh to turn away from the spirits of the world. Therefore, John writes, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. The Antichrist is anyone who's against Christ. Anyone who doesn't profess Christ. It's not some big beast. Not some evil creature. As we go out into the world, or even as we come into a congregation, anyone who is not in Christ, is anti-Christ. These are very black and white observations, and John uses this over and over again, and we see this through the Johannian epistles. We, we just see it's either darkness or light. It's either love or hate. This is what John is talking about. You are either in Christ or anti-Christ. They're from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. The world is going to tell you, you're fine. You don't need God. You don't need Jesus. It's going to pervert your idea and your understanding of who God is. And this happens two different ways. It's either going to uh, condone what you're doing and saying, listen, God is a God of love. God is love. God is love. God is love. He's not going to judge you. That's not a God of love to the victim of my sin. Or they're going to tell you you're not good enough for God. <laughs> I know what you did. There's no way you can be in a right relationship with God. You know how many people I talk to like that? Do you know the smile that comes on their face when I explain to them what John 16 means to 316 means to them? Do you, do, do you know what it means that the shame that was brought down on them, when you explain to them to, to the love of God through Christ Jesus, that that was the reason why he sent his son? The weight that that lifts off somebody. You see, both impressions of a false god need to be addressed. Both spirits need to be renewed, to wash, be washed, not corrupted. Because both souls are what God came to redeem. We test the spirit. How do we test it? We test it through Scripture. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Charles Spurgeon wrote, Consider how precious the soul must be when both God and the devil are after it. My goodness, the value that is in the souls in each and every one of us and what we can't see as human beings, we can't qualify that it has value because we have no idea of it. How do we understand it? We understand it by going deep into his word. The author of Hebrew writes, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit. The corrupt soul that, that, that is in us right now. Through the word of God, we come to faith in the one true God. We don't need anything other than this book. It shows the love of God, the calling of God, the redemption of God. 
It speaks to not just the, the physical. As we go through these historical narratives, it's not just speaking of the physical. It's giving us an example of the spiritual war that's going on within this world. pierces the, 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 the division of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. That's our spirit. That's what drives and motivates our soul. John is speaking of something different. He's very clear in his writing. This he's, he, he's talking about is not para, parakletos, which is the, the advocate. He's not talking about the Holy Spirit here. He's talking about the breath of life, which God breathes into each and every one of us, that spirit that is in us that, that has grown accustomed to a world of sin and that drives the soul in that direction. As Paul says, he, he tells us that, that through Christ Jesus, he has separated the sin into the flesh. We're no longer a slave to sin. Our spirit is renewed. His Holy Spirit has come inside of us and has walked alongside of our spirit that God breathed into us to give a different motivation to our soul. Now, how do we know if a spirit is from God? Test it. How do we know if our understanding of who God is is right? Test it. Here's the answer sheet right here. The test is easy. It's open book. Brothers and sisters, If you look at this book and you see just the text on the page, if you're not seeing the spiritual, I would beg of you that before you read, pray. Pray. Not prayers for anything physical. And, and when I look at our prayer list, I, I, everything that we see on there are physical needs, and I understand that's important. And I'm not saying that they should be taken off. I'm saying our prayer list should be doubled. I covered your prayers, man. Not over the gout that I was suffering last week, but pray for my soul. Pray for my walk. Pray that, that, that somehow through the, the miracle of the Spirit that God has placed in me, that I may walk in a way that is above reproach, that I honor my family I honor my wife, I honor my children, and most of all, I honor God. That my soul is not corrupted because it is driven in, in the right direction by the Spirit that God placed inside of me because it is led by the Holy Spirit that he has entrusted in me and therefore motivates my flesh. You see, as God talks about, about the oneness with which we must walk, each one of us must walk in that oneness. Spirit, soul, and body. If you're not at peace this morning, test the spirit. If you, if you feel disturbed, pray for your soul. He is a good, good father. That's what this book says. He will give and give and give. Because that's his kingdom. And he so loved you that he gave his only son who came in the flesh and died on a cross that your soul may live eternal through him. There's so many things out there today to corrupt our mind, this mind. And it will affect this mind. Every single person. I can get a podcast tomorrow if I wanted to. I, just, I, I honestly, I don't have the time, but <laughs> what's the purpose? If I could tell you anything that's helped me is that I spend this much time in podcasts and television and extracurricular books, and I try to spend this much time in prayer and this much time in reading. Everyone has an opinion. And if you are going to test the Spirit, you need the sword of God. 
which is his word. Not here, but in here. So that it drives your spirit to protect your soul. How is that possible? The advocate, his Holy Spirit that is entrusted in each one of you. We thank God for that. Will you pray for me? Lord God, you are a God of such great gifts that go so far beyond the physical. Satan tried to tempt your son with the physical need, but he corrected him. And he said, I spoke to my servant Moses. He tried to corrupt the, the, the flesh of Jesus who came in the flesh through the pride. And Jesus corrected him and said, I spoke this through my servant Moses, check Deuteronomy. He tried to corrupt the image of God. And your son corrected him and said, I spoke this also through my servant Moses, check Deuteronomy. Lord God, everything we need to know you and to know life eternal is in your book. Lord God, I pray that you strengthen your spirit in us, that our spirit would walk in line with your spirit, that we would be one just as you were one, that you would protect the soul that you gave your son for. Lord God, I thank you for the love, the grace that you bestowed upon all your creation. Lord God, I pray that you protect us from the teachings and the spirits of those that are against your son, against your perfect plan for salvation. And Lord God, we know that you desire all to be saved. So Lord God, I just pray that you would eradicate those voices and whatever that looks like. We trust in you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.